morning, friends. I'm author and urbanologist Max Grinnell. Today we're out here on a beautiful sunny day to give you this program on Chicago's LGBTQ plus community. Along our travels, we'll stop by the Legacy Walk. We'll talk with the folks at a center on Halstead. We'll stop by the Gerber Hart Library and Archives and also make a few other stops to talk with members of the community. Good morning, friends. We are here at the Gerberhart Library and Archives with Will Brandt, the Executive Director. Will, thank you for being with us this morning. Thanks for coming. Could you tell folks who maybe have never experienced the library, who are Gerber and Hart? Henry Gerber and Pearl Hart um, is the library's named after. Henry Gerber was the founder of the 1924 Society for Human Rights, which was the first known, at the time it was just gay male, uh, rights organization in the United States. It lasted for about six months. It got busted up. He left. Uh, Pearl Hart, there, she was about three years older. They were contemporaries of Henry Gerber. Uh, she was a lawyer. She mostly did immigration law. Um, she also was the person that when the police entrapped you, she would defend you in court. Uh, mm -hmm. which is a, she was known as the um, guardian of the gay and lesbian community in that way. She was discreetly lesbian, um, would publicly speak on gay and, rights, gay and lesbian rights issues um, in public forums back in the 50s and 60s. Oh, that's wonderful, thank you. And I remember when the Gerber Hart Library and Archives were over on Granville, could you tell us a little bit about the history of the Library and Archives? Sure. Uh, Gerber Hart was founded in 1981. It was at a time when most libraries, uh, public libraries, college libraries, did not collect very many LGBTQ books. There were not many that were around. Uh, we've always had a component of being a circulating library, public circulating library, as well as a research center. Although again, in 1981, there were no, not very many queer studies programs. Uh, so not very many people are doing research here. Um, this is about the, the fourth place we have been in, um, each time expanding the space because our, our collection grows. Yeah, right, right now, most people are, you know, we have half and half in terms of people doing research and people doing um, just reading stuff for casual purposes and reasons. Uh, we have middle schoolers, high schoolers here doing research for a Chicago Metro History Fair, mm. as well as you know, college classes come to visit, people writing dissertations, people writing books, people doing documentaries. So there's a wide range of people that come to use our, our resources. That's wonderful. Friends, I'm back here with Will, and I'm next to a huge tongue. Will, t tell us about this tongue. Yeah, this is a tongue that used to hang in Carol Speakeasy, which is a bar down on Well Street. Uh, uh, Carol Speakeasy was owned by Mother Carol, who is known as the, the mother of all drag queens. Uh, she was a female impersonator at that time. She used to stick out her tongue a lot, so that's why they did uh, a replication of her tongue. Uh, if you remember back in the day, this was back in the 80s and 90s, people used to smoke a lot in bars. When we got this tongue, it was very filled with um, all that tar and nicotine and smoke we got. I got to clean it. Uh, it, was not a, it was not a nice job. It was not an easy job. I got to clean it like they did the Sistine Chapel with, ironically, a toothbrush and soapy water. Uh, this is very delicate material, so I couldn't take a major scrub brush to it. Um, it was gross, uh, but it looks a lot better than it did now. Thanks, Will. Thank you. Morning friends, it is a beautiful, beautiful Monday here in Chicago, late September, and I'm here with the CEO of the Center on Halstead, Tico Valle. Tico, thank you for having us. Welcome, welcome, and it's great to be out on the roof deck. We are so fortunate to be here. Might you start by telling our viewers a little bit about this amazing roof deck in the building. So welcome to the Center on Halstead, the most comprehensive LGBTQ community center in the Midwest. We serve our community through health and wellness programming and through public programs. That's wonderful. That's really wonderful. And this rooftop normally, uh, during pandemic or before the pandemic, what would normally happen? be happening? So one of the beautiful things about Center on Fawcett is there's something here for everyone. So this roof deck 
which is beautiful. It's the right spot to see the parade come down mm. home. Hosted Street here, along Hosted, and it's we had a wedding this weekend. We're going to have a bar mitzvah next weekend. We have a lot of community fundraisers. We have a wonderful barbecue grill there for meals to share, um, but a lot of um, space to gather um, and celebrate community. And that's really what I think most people have seen before, and certainly during uh, this pandemic is. People really crave that community, too. They do, they do. Um, all through the pandemic, even though our programs closed and a lot of staff work from home, our lobby remained open as a resource for our community that is experiencing homelessness, um, for a place just to be safe from COVID. Mm. Um, we did testing and we did um, vaccines that continue on today. That's really wonderful. Are there some events in the coming months that you're particularly excited about here at the center? Well, there's always events taking place in our theater. So I really encourage people to visit our website, centeronhosted.org. Um, the volleyball leagues are back in our gymnasium. So volleyball is taking place almost every night and over the weekend. Uh, Open gym will be coming back. So that happens Wonderful. on Mondays and Wednesdays. That sounds fantastic. And that really, as you said earlier, a really robust set of amazing activities for the community. That's wonderful. Tico, thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Come back anytime. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. We're so fortunate to be here with Victor Salvo the uh, co-founder and executive director, director of the Legacy Project. Victor, thank you for meeting with us today. It's my pleasure, Max. How are you guys doing? We're doing pretty well. It's the second season of doing these programs, so we're so fortunate to be sitting down with you. Thank you. For, uh, Victor, could you tell us a little bit, for folks who may not have heard of the Legacy Project, what do you do? So the Legacy Project is a, not, uh, it's a Chicago-based charity with a national footprint. Uh, we look into and explore and celebrate the contributions that LGBTQ people have made to world history and culture as a means of countering the ignorance which underlies anti-LGBTQ bullying in both in our schools and in society at large. So Legacy maintains several different aspects that support its collective mission. One of those is the Legacy Wall, which is our traveling installation that's been to 36 cities in the United States mm. since 2015. Uh, another is the Legacy Walk, which I think we're gonna take some, a little bit of a stroll today. The Legacy Walk is the world's only outdoor LGBTQ history museum. It is international and multicultural in scope. And it is uh, really the largest installation in the world that has ever been declared a historic landmark because of its significance as an LGBTQ site. Uh, and that happened in Chicago in 2019. So we use the Legacy Walk as an outdoor classroom for students who come here on field trips and we take them through and they get to learn about people from a variety of different fields of contribution, different types of people, different countries, and they, they get to understand what kinds of accomplishments LGBTQ people have made over the course of human history. Friends, we're out here with Victor again, here on the Legacy Walk, and Victor's gonna tell us a little bit about this plaque. So this is a plaque to Alan Matheson Turing, who is considered to be the father of computer science. Turing was a gay man in Britain during an era when it was considered to be both illegal and a mental illness. They call him the father of computer science because he devised, using the Turing methodology, the use of ones and zeros, the establishment of binary code. And it was the Turing methodology that was employed by the British government to help break the Nazi Enigma Code during World War II. The Enigma Code was being used to coordinate the movement of U-boats throughout the North Atlantic, which were sinking supply ships, trying to supply the European theater of the war. Turing's group, obviously, at Bludgeley Park, succeeded in breaking the Enigma Code, which actually laid the groundwork for D-Day to actually take place, because they were able to get materials into the European theater of the war to lay, to lay that, those plans out. The problem for Turing, of course, was that shortly after World War II was over with, um, and after he had also posited the idea of 
um, artificial intelligence was actually Alan Turing's conception. And the test for artificial intelligence is called the Turing test, uh, still to this day, some 76 years after it was created. Turing was arrested for admitting that he had had a sexual liaison with a man. He was convicted and given the option of imprisonment or chemical castration. He chose chemical castration. And, you know, your brain is basically a bath of hormones. And once they began to alter the chemical balance in his blood, he lost the ability to think in the way that he was accustomed to. And by every measure, he was a genius. Turing slipped into a depression, and two weeks before his 42nd birthday, in June of 1954, he committed suicide by biting into an apple laced with cyanide. The loss to humanity of, for having the father of computer science not live to be a full life into his 80s is incalculable. So we celebrate Turing here, and this plaque, which is the one that I actually uh, personally co-sponsored, um, was actually dedicated to LGBTQ youth who have committed suicide, letting them know that they will never be forgotten. Good afternoon, everyone, viewers, listeners, watchers. We are here with Tracy Bame co-founder of Windy City Times and co-publisher of the Chicago Reader, Tracy. So glad to have you here. Thanks for having me here today. We are so excited and we want you to tell us a little bit about, for folks who may not know, where are we right now? And tell them a little bit about this place's importance. We're in Lakeview in Chicago, sometimes referred to as Boys Town, um, but it goes way back before gay, gay men have colonized it with a lot of gay bars. Um, there was actually in, right in this area a lesbian community center in the early 1970s, and there were a whole lot of other um, great lesbian, trans, gay history throughout this neighborhood. So that's why we're doing this here today, but of course LGBTQ people are everywhere, and this is just one of the center of the universes for us. That is wonderful, um, and thank you for that. Also, since we are staying on the Legacy Walk, Maybe you can tell us a little bit about the plaque we're in front of. Sure, we're in front of uh, one of the many plaques of the Legacy Project, which is one of my favorite projects ever in Chicago. Victor Salvo was Herculean in birthing this, <laughs> this uh, walking LGBTQ museum. We're in front of a very important plaque. Silvio Rivera was a transgender activist in New York City, one of the Stonewall activists who also fought mercilessly against her own community, the LGBTQ community, to make sure that trans rights were included in those. So she's unfortunately passed away in 2002, but her impact is profound. There are still projects and activists that are motivated by the work of Sylvia Rivera. So I really wanted to honor her today. So just like Sylvia Rivera, Marsha P. Johnson was an incredible New York City-based transgender activist. Um, her history has not penetrated the mainstream like Harvey Milk and some of the other pioneers of LGBTQ rights, but her work and Sylvia Rivera's work was, were instrumental in making sure that transgender people had a seat at the table a voice at Pride. Um, she, uh, the two of them, Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, both fought both the internal fights within the LGBT community of who is part of our community, as well as the external oppression of transgender people. Two very important parts of our movement. I'm so glad that the Legacy Project found sponsorships to make sure that their voices weren't lost to history. Even while they were alive, um, they were not getting much attention, but once someone has passed away, it's, it's even harder to make sure that their stories are told in our schools, curriculum, our libraries. So we're really honored to have these two plaques as part of the Legacy Project in Chicago. Wonderful. And for friends might be out there, might be watching this, if this has been part of, of your life and your passion, are there ways that people can reach out and try to be allies to folks in the LGBTQ community? Being an ally to the LGBT community is very difficult because we are everywhere, right? We do all sorts of things. There are needs across the, the board. Um, I would say pick a lane, right? So yeah. if you care about violence against the community, if you care about um, issues of suicide prevention, if you care about feeding people, whatever issues you care about generally, there is an LGBTQ organization that's probably working on that issue. So we have an incredible array of LGBT organizations and HIV AIDS organizations in Chicago. Start, just start working on that issue, start educating yourself, 
We have the Gerber Hart Library and Archives. We have this legacy project. Um, we have many ways that you can go online. I have a chicagogayhistory.org website where you can look at 200 oral histories of LGBTQ people. So start somewhere. Know that you're gonna make mistakes. Uh, any ally needs to understand that you need a thick skin and you need to, to really focus on an area that, that you care about most so that you stick with it. Um, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and I think also, I would say to the LGBTQ community that's listening, also pick a lane. Right, there are many allied organizations that are um, very inclusive of LGBTQ rights. We should be part of all movements. We should not segregate ourselves into any one movement. Um, but, but figure out something that you could do to give back. Some people are great at frontline protests. Other people want to serve meals, walk dogs, do something that uh, has an impact on the LGBTQ movement. Tracy, for folks who are watching who may not be familiar with the legacy of Windy City Times. Could you tell us a little bit about this crucial publication? So gay media have played an important part in the gay movement nationally, locally, internationally. Very important part of it. So there were fits and starts of different gay publications over the years, including the very first gay rights organization in the United States was started in 1925 by several men, including Henry Gerber. And they had a newsletter called Friendship and Freedom. Nobody has any copies of it, but there are pictures of uh, a copy of it in Germany. Of all places. So there have been gay publications uh, for decades. In the 1960s, there was a very important uh, publication called, produced by the Mattachin Midwest. It was the Mattachin Midwest newsletter. So there was a precedent for gay media, quote unquote. And in the 1970s, there were gay newspapers. And in 1985, I was co founder of Windy City Times. It was so important to have our own publications because we were the only ones covering so much of the depth of our movement. You might read about us once in a while in the Tribune or the Sun-Times or on TV back then, but oftentimes it was either biased um, or they, they ignored us. Like, we mm. actually preferred when they ignored us because sometimes mm. it was horrible in its coverage of us. So our own newspapers uh, were a way for us to objectively see ourselves, the good and the bad, the controversies, the scandals, um, the violence uh, internally and externally on our community. I look back on those, those publications of the 19... 80s that we did, and it is truly the first draft of history. We know that there are nonfiction and fiction authors that use gay media, not just Windy City Times, to find out what was happening in the gay community because you cannot look anywhere else. It wasn't being documented, there was no internet, so gay newspapers provide those kind of breadcrumbs to the history and to the people that made our movement possible. Mm, wonderful. Thank you so much, Tracy. Thank you. Friends, today we've explored a small fraction of Chicago's LGBTQ experience and history. There's a lot more that you can do, both in terms of talking to people, learning from libraries and archives, and thinking about how this community has changed and continues to change. As most of you know, I like to end each of our programs with a little haiku inspired by what we've seen, discussed, and thought about today. Their story is not lost. Always present, look closely. Come out and listen. <laughs>